So this is um, Bella Tanza, and Roman has joined her on stage. She's going to read the scriptures just in a minute. Bella and Roman are our student workers, but their main focus is being mum and dad to two wonderful little children, uh, and also their uh, Bible college, final year of um, Bible college. Uh, and it's just great that Roman and Bella are getting involved in leading the student work, which is small, but some really good small beginnings with the student work. Very challenging in lockdown, so please do be praying for them. Uh, and uh, Bella shared once during the summer, and um, this is second time just speaking in CC. Really excited about what you're going to be doing as part of our series. Uh, worshippers in the wilderness as we explore different ways to worship when we can't uh, sing together. So I think Kirsty's going to pray for Bella and then over to you, Bella. Great. Excited to hear you speak today, Bella. So let's pray. Lord, thank you for Bella. Her name means beautiful and how fortunate we are as a congregation to have this beautiful woman of God preaching your word. Thank you for the time that she has put into exploring your word, Lord Jesus. And thank you that we get to uh, get the fruits from that, Lord. So I pray that you'll just bless her today. Let her be receptive to your spirit uh, as it speaks in her, in her soul, Lord Jesus, and as we uh, as a congregation, benefit from that. So just, yeah, bless her, Lord, and um, make sure she has fun with preaching your word today, Lord Jesus, in your powerful name. Amen. Can everybody hear me? Yes, the sound okay? Great. So as Rupert has already said, we're exploring ways of worshiping God without singing at the moment as a church congregation. And we've looked at different ways. We we looked at silence and how we can worship God through silence, the gift of tongues. We have looked about at how we can pour ourselves out to God in our brokenness, and this can be a kind of worship. Um, we've learned that we can give our best to God and we can be creative. And today we're going to look at thankfulness as the final part of our series and how we can express worship by saying thanks to God. At the beginning of our time together, I would like to invite you to think of a person you know that stands out for their thankfulness. A person you have met and a person that you have seen live out gratefulness and thankfulness in a way that has really impressed you. And as you think of this person, maybe you want to think about how have you become aware of their gratefulness? How has this person influenced you as a person, but also the community that this person is part of? I'll give you a moment to picture that person in your head. When I think of this grateful person in my life, I'm thinking of a friend back in Austria. I've known her for 35 years since I joined the church as a little girl. Um, she's part of my first home, home church in Vienna. And this woman was my Sunday school teacher, she was my youth leader, um, and she's been an encouraging voice and a wise voice in my life for many, many years. And when I travel back to Austria, she's one of the first people that I want to meet at least once while I'm there. I love being in her company, also because she radiates gratefulness. She has cultivated a thankful heart for many years, for decades, and she has put effort into it, almost like cultivating a beautiful garden. I don't know if you know that feeling when you go for a little walk and you w walk past the garden that's beautiful and you think, wow, I want something like this. Her thankfulness is contagious. I don't know about the person that you're thinking of, but when I watch my friend, I think I want this too. She spots God's goodness at every corner of her life. Um, and I, I want to do the same when I see her live this out. If we want to learn a skill, then the best thing we can do is to watch somebody who's really good at this, isn't it? 
Um, so when we look at gratefulness today, we'll spend some time in the company of the Apostle Paul, who is also called the Apostle of Gratefulness. How do we do? How, how do we know that Paul was a grateful person? Um, well, first he wrote about gratefulness in his letters to various churches and to individuals many, many times. Altogether, gratefulness is mentioned 49 times in connection with the life of Paul in the book of Acts and in his various letters. Paul lives and breathes thankfulness. He's thankful for many things, for other Christians, for their faith, their support and their provision in his life. But above all, he is grateful for Christ's role in his life. He's eternally grateful to Jesus. And this is especially wonderful because he used to be an enemy of Jesus. He used to be a persecutor of the Christian church. But then he had a personal encounter on the road to Damascus. And his life was completely turned around. And he dedicated the remainder of his life to following Jesus and to telling everyone about him that would want to hear. Our passage today that Roman is going to read in a moment, is from Paul's letter to the Colossian church. This was a church in Asia Minor, in present-day Turkey. Thankfulness is one of the important themes that comes up in this letter, and especially in chapter 3 that we're going to look at. Paul reminds the Colossians here that they have a new life in Christ. And because of this new life, he urges them to live accordingly and to show attitudes and behaviors um, that go with this new lifestyle, and not the ones they used to um, used to show, like slander, immorality of all kinds, greed, lies, and bad language. Those things don't suit the Colossians anymore. Instead, Paul motivates them to put on new habits that express their new identity in Christ. We'll be reading from chapter 3, verses 12. To 17. And while Roman is reading, let's pay attention to how many times we hear about gratefulness in this short passage. Colossians, Colossians 3, um, 12 to 17. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. With all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. How often is gratefulness mentioned here? How often did you count? It's three times. Um, three times in, in only five verses, and I think this should show us how important it is to Paul. Um, and I want to invite you to look at three simple truths with me today that emerge from this passage. Firstly, thankfulness enjoys company. Secondly, thankfulness is a heart matter. And thirdly, thankfulness is a lifestyle. So we'll briefly look at these three points together. Let us start with the first one. Thankfulness enjoys company. What do I mean by this? First of all, I mean that the thankfulness that Paul talks about here and in many other passages is closely connected with relationships. In verse 17, Paul motivates his readers to sing to God with gratitude in their hearts. Gratefulness is not just something that exists on its own, that could exist in isolation. It's always embedded in relationships. It needs two parties. It needs a person that's grateful, and it needs somebody who receives the thanks. 
Let's take a quick look at the Greek word for thankfulness that Paul uses here. Um, Eucharistia. Um, this is the noun. Um, and in chapter 3, Paul uses lots of other verb forms, but they basically point back to this word. And at the center of Eucharistia, you can see the word charis, which is quite a popular name in Christian circles at the moment. Charis means grace. So thankfulness is really about God's grace. It's about our acknowledging his grace in our lives. It means that we see the blessings that we have not earned. It means that we see what has been freely given to us and that we acknowledge this. To Paul, it seems the most natural thing to express his thankfulness. It's not something that he keeps to himself in quiet contemplation. And yes, gratefulness is an attitude, but it's more than this. Gratefulness is always closely connected with worship, with thanksgiving. His gratitude and his worship go hand in hand. They cannot be separated. And in fact, this word, this Greek word, Eucharistia, does not distinguish between being grateful and thanksgiving. They're the same thing. I found that really fascinating when I was looking at the interlinear translation. So how do we know that Paul was thankful? We talked about this before. He expresses it 49 times. And one of my favorite accounts in the life of the Apostle Paul is in Acts chapter 27, when Paul and 275 other prisoners are on their way to Rome and they get shipwrecked off the coast of Malta. The passengers are gripped by fear and no wonder they are because they've been in tur tur turmoil for 14 days. They haven't eaten, the Bible is saying, they're weak and they're anxious. And what does Paul do? He urges them to eat. He knows that God is going to rescue the people in the ship because God has spoken to him about it. But what does he do? He thanks God. He breaks bread. He thanks God for it. And then he eats with the people that are present. Even in the face of great difficulty, Paul remembers that thanking God is a really important thing. And he doesn't keep it to himself. He expresses it in front of everyone present. Paul lives and breathes thankfulness. He doesn't just tell others to be grateful. He doesn't just talk the talk. He actually walks the walk. And he continually expresses his own gratitude to others and above all to God. Thankfulness enjoys company. It's deeply relational and it is designed to be expressed. But there's another aspect here that I would briefly like to touch upon. When we look at our passage, we will see that thankfulness actually enjoys the company of many other good qualities, of many other virtues here in this text. Paul writes in verse 12 of our text, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. All of these are so-called fruits of the Spirit. When we are connected to God, and when we let him work in our character, these fruits will grow as a natural result. In verse 15, Paul writes about peace as another quality that the Colossians should adopt. And then comes a short sentence, and be thankful, full stop. Thankfulness is a quality that goes hand in hand with other virtues. They like each other's company. There is even scientific evidence for this um, to back this up. There's a book I love. It's written by a Russian scientist um, called Sonia Lyubomirsky. Um, she lives in the States, and um, it's her job to do research on happiness and what makes people happy. And she's written a great, very practical book called The How of Happiness. I don't know if you've come across it. I can really recommend it, by the way. And she says in her book, she writes in her book, thankful people are happy people. They're willing to help others they are more responsive to other people's needs. They are more willing to forgive and are less materialistic than less thankful people. Thankfulness enjoys company. That was our first point. And let us look at point number two now. Um, thankfulness is a heart matter. We've read in verse 15, let the message of Christ dwell, dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, 
singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. We are supposed to thank God, but what does with gratitude in your hearts mean? It obviously mean that, it means that our thanksgiving, our worship to God, must come from a genuine place of devotion for God. Can you remember moments in your life when you were simply overflowing with gratitude because God had done something wonderful? Um, where you just stood in awe of God's love for you? I remember some of those special moments. One was a few years ago when our car broke down and my husband Roman and I prayed a prayer of faith. Lord, we prayed, we need a new car. We don't have any money to, to pay for it, but we need one. And um, please give us a car and please let it be a seven-seater so that we can also serve other people and give them lifts and help them move house. So it was a very specific prayer that we prayed. Um, the next day, you won't believe it, I got a text from a friend. Nobody knew about our prayer, apart from God and the two of us. Bella, we're getting rid of our car. Wanted to scrap it, but you kept coming to our mind. Do you need one? What amazed me the most was that the car had seven seats. And it served us for two years, us and others. We named it Carissa because it was, it's a car, but also because of Caris, this idea of God's grace. Yeah? Our cars all have names, our present car is called Polly, isn't it, Roman? <laughs> yeah, but Carissa was a, a special gift from God. Um, and we knew that it was by his grace that, that we could use her. It, so that was one of the many wow moments that I had with God. I'm sure you can think of some instances like that, where you just connected with God in deep thankfulness and gratitude and just overflowed. These are the moments when we feel so connected with God. We feel known, we feel loved, we praise him. And it's just a natural thing to worship him in response. You're so good, Lord. Overflowing gratitude compels us to worship God. We stand in awe of Jesus and his goodness to us. But what about the times when life is tough? When we do not feel like thanking God? When we feel there is not much to thank him for? And maybe it's a time like this. A time when we feel restricted. A time when we miss being close to people we love. Maybe a time of financial difficulty. A time when we just long to go back to normal. And don't we all long for that? Can I thank God in a time like this? And can I thank him with my heart? One of the discoveries that I have made recently is that in the Jewish context, the heart does not just refer to emotions. Emotions are part of what Paul as a Jew would see as the heart, but the heart in the Jewish mindset is actually a lot more than emotions. It refers to the entire inner being, the entire inner person. Our thoughts, our will, our knowledge, our desires. So when Paul writes, with gratitude in your hearts, he does also imply the human will to worship God. He does also imply our readiness to thank him, whatever the situation is that we're in. Paul writes in a different letter to another church, the Thessalonians, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. How on earth can we do this, I'm asking? Thanking God when we don't feel like it? A few weeks ago, I had a, an enlightening conversation with my daughter, Anna Lauren, on this subject, and she's given me the permission to share this. I often find that God speaks to me through my children. I wonder if some of the parents can relate to this. We were talking about the pandemic and her disappointments in all of this. Mama, she said, in German, of course, because we speak German at home. Mama, I want to see the good things that are happening. But it is so hard. Something with me, in me connected with the truth when she was speaking out these words. Mama, I want to see the good things, but it's so hard. You know, I said to her, I feel exactly the same sometimes and often at the moment. But if you want to see the good things, 
This is such an important first step. Seeing the good things and wanting to see the good thing. God sees that. He will help you to be a good spotter. You do your part and he will do the rest to make it possible. I mulled over this conversation for a couple more weeks um, afterwards. This was not just advice for my daughter. It was advice for me. Do I want to see God's blessings in my life? I, wanted, I asked myself, do you want to see God's blessings in your life even when life is tough? Thankfulness is a heart matter. Being thankful for my heart has to do with our whole inner person. This includes feelings, yes, but it's not just about feelings. Our will also has a part to play in this. And we need God's help on this journey to gratefulness. He has promised to be there. And if we follow Jesus wholeheartedly, we will get to know him better. And he has promised to transform us. Paul puts it like this in, our letter to, in the letter to the Colossians, just before our passage. You have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. And this brings us to our third and last truth today. Thankfulness is a lifestyle. I wonder how Paul felt when he was writing this letter to the Colossian church. Things did not look good for him from a human perspective. He was in a prison cell, probably in Rome, awaiting his trial. And still he continued to be thankful. How was he able to be graceful in the face of death? His words in Colossians 2, verse 6, give us a hint. Just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. There it is again. The advice he gives is something that Paul himself lives. He's deeply rooted in Jesus like a strong old knobbly tree that has slowly dug its roots into the soil. A wind, even a storm, will not uproot him easily because he is strong in his relationship with his Savior and his thankfulness overflows. This sounds wonderful, and I want this in my life, I'm thinking. And sometimes I can see it. But then there are times in my life when ungratefulness takes the upper hand. Moments when I feel entitled, moments when I mumble and grumble because things are not going the way I want them to go. Do you have the same experience sometimes? I often know what would be right and what would be the right thing to do, but then I don't. And Paul also had this experience, this inner struggle. He writes about it in a different letter to the Roman church in chapter 7. Paul writes, I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. I'm so grateful for God's forgiveness in my life, and I'm grateful for seeing that Paul was human too. He was a great example, yes. Um, and he, he was a grateful man, but he was human, and he still sinned, and he disappointed God sometimes. But because of Jesus and his death, Paul was a part of God's chosen people, holy and beloved. He saw the Colossians like this. He saw, God saw Paul, sees Paul like this. He saw the Colossians like this. And he sees us like this when we're part um, of his church, when we belong to him. Paul knew who he was in Christ, and that was definitely the source of his thankfulness and at the heart of it. But I'm convinced that it did take him time while he, he was still learning to become a thankful man. He wasn't the same thankful man at the beginning of his life as he was at the end of his life. He practiced thankfulness over many, many years. He willfully embraced thankfulness, and he practiced and practiced some more like practicing a musical instrument that people learn to play. And those of us who play one will know what I'm talking about. Or those of us who have learned to speak a foreign language. New words don't appear out of nowhere. We need to understand their meaning and then we have to use them. I'm a German teacher to adult students and I keep telling my students, 
you have to use a word at least three times before it becomes part of your repertoire. Practice is just as important when we talk about grat gratefulness. And Paul knows that. And this is why he encourages the Colossian church in our passage in verse 12, to clothe themselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. And later he talks about love, peace and thankfulness. These are qualities that we willfully need to put on every day, not just once and for all. Like a new shirt that we take out of the wardrobe in the morning and put on, and the next day we need a new shirt. Thankfulness is a lifestyle that will grow in us when we practice. Paul writes in our passage in verse 17, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. In other words, as you go about your day, continue giving thanks to God, the giver of all good things. And if we persist in this, this will become a lifestyle. I wonder what helps you personally to practice thankfulness in your life. In our family, we have a, a weekly tradition that we have been practicing for a few years now. Um, and Dominic, can you put the, the video on? Uh, while you're watching, I explain what we're doing. So almost every Sunday, Saturday night, sorry, at the dinner table, we fill an empty glass to the point where it overflows as a reminder of God's goodness in our lives. We exactly know what's going to happen because we've seen it hundreds of times before, but we're waiting for the moment when the glass overflows. Um, yeah, it's so exciting. And my kids often laugh when they see this, this happening. It, it, it creates joy to see this glass overflowing because in our hearts we have connected uh, this glass with the treasure of the memories that speak of God's grace in our lives. And then we talk about our week and we drink the, uh, the grape juice together and we tell each other where we have spotted God's goodness and his loving hand and we share stories of, of our week and moments of gratefulness. And the fascinating thing is we have always found something to be thankful for, even in the toughest weeks, even when we were heartbroken, um, tired, stressed, there's always been at least one or two things where we felt God has given us something good in this week. And we miss the moment when we forget one week and say, we have to do it again. It's good for us to remember. I wonder what helps you to cultivate thankfulness in your life. We'll have a short time of silence now to give you some space to think about this question. And then Rupert is going to lead us in a communal conversation on the question. What helps you to cultivate thankfulness in your life?